Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Tobias Magnitsky and we are here today at ML at Herion with our seminar 33. And today will be all about non orographic gravity waves and their parametrizations with neural networks. And I'm very happy that Matthew Chantry, the author of the paper we are going to discuss today, is here with us. So thanks a lot for coming here today, Matthew. And um, we have seen a few neural networks already now that do parametrizations, but I think today is the very first time that we actually see it working in an online fashion. So even though we do offline training, and we've seen a couple of times now where this now horribly fails when implementing them in the model bag. But um, today we're going to see a pretty neat example of how this could be done. And yeah, thanks a lot for being here today, and I will give it to you. Thank you very much. Uh... Tobias, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, as I said, please do uh, stop and, uh, and interrupt me if uh, I've, I've not made something very clear. So this is some uh, work that I completed when I was working at the University of Oxford, and I'm now sort of building on that at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And I'm very grateful to my co-authors uh, below who were uh, very involved. Uh, this was a, very much a, a team project uh, sort of split across those two different institutes. Um, and uh, the first part of my talk uh, is going to be quite uh, pedagogical uh, to try and give a background of why we might want to do this, uh, what are the different approaches and what are their advantages and disadvantages. And so, and I'm going to be, my focus is, has more been on the weather forecasting rather than the climate, but there's a big overlap between those two problems. And occasionally I'll touch on sort of um, where I think the differences are between those two uh, focuses. Uh, but in, in, in both of those settings, we have a large number of physical processes that are either not at all or only partly represented by explicitly by our, our, our models of, of weather or climate forecasting. And that's because uh, the, the, the main physics that's going on is happening below the grid scale of our global climate model or our weather model. So uh, be that on orders of 10 kilometers for weather modeling or sort of maybe more up to hundreds of kilometers for, for climate modeling. There's lots of physical processes that are going on down here. And this lovely uh, schematic from, from, from Peter Bauer sort of tries to sort of classify a few of them, particular, but particularly if we were looking more at the, the, the climate um, element, there will be even more processes that you might want to, uh, to, to have go on uh, that are going on in this model. And while some of them might not be very expensive, certainly when you start aggregating these together, um, you find that this is a, a big part of the cost of uh, forecasting, uh, be that in, in weather or climate. So uh, apologies for this very blurry um, pie chart, but this is showing for the uh, ECMWF's uh, IFS uh, forecasting model that about a quarter of the time and the most expensive element of their forecast is the, the aggregation of all these unresolved physical processes. Um, so this is uh, an expensive component and this becomes even more expensive uh, for climate modeling where um, the, the dynamics, so solving the Navier-Stokes equations becomes cheaper because, or relatively cheaper because the grid is a bit coarser uh, and you have even more physical processes that are important for those long time scales. Um, and so the question uh, that, that, that's going on in, in this field is, is whether machine learning can be helpful um, in all sorts of ways for uh, improving uh, physical parameterization schemes or accelerating physical parameterization schemes. And uh, one of the aspects I just want to get across is, is while uh, on my uh, figure a few, a few slides ago, there were lots of different physical processes going on here. They all have a very similar structure in terms of uh, 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 code or, or, or layout of, of the dynamics because uh, almost uniformly they are thinking about um, a, 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 a column separated case. So what does that mean? Was that e each vertical column in your in your model is solved uh, separately, which is great for efficiency and uh, typically is, is quite a good approximation. It can start to break down in, in, in some or other of the parameterization schemes. But that means in, in all of these parameterization schemes, you have profiles of winds, of temperatures, of humidities, and you're trying to find the impact for this given profile um, in space of, of a particular physical process. So it might be the impact of heating from radiative 
um, um, effects, or it might be in the case we're going to talk about the impact of um, uh, gravity waves breaking uh, that starts below the grid scale, but have an impact on the, the, the result flow. And so there's a lot of shared inputs. And so while there's quite a lot of work across a range of parameterization schemes, I hope that we're all sort of pointing in similar directions or learning from one another, because I think there's going to be a lot of shared knowledge that comes along the way. And on this subject, I wanted to just uh, talk about what I see as a sort of spectrum of possible approaches to using machine learning um, within the, the, the idea of, 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 of physical parameterization schemes. Um, and I'm definitely not uh, putting sort of some of them as better or worse. They have advantages and disadvantages across the ski, across this sort of spectrum. So uh, very quickly on, on the left, you have this idea of uh, using some high resolution data or some, some, some source of data to learn a new parameterization scheme. So this is obviously very appealing. Um, if you think that the, the, the schemes are flawed, they've had to come up with uh, their closure schemes that uh, have had some mathematical approximations on them. Um, so that's very appealing, but there's been big challenges uh, for stability or having a large or robust enough data set to do that. So there's lots of interesting work on that, particularly by um, uh, Noah Brenowitz and Chris Brotherton and Stefan Rasp and, and a few others. Uh, and that's particularly uh, popular for the problem of convection where we perhaps uh, think that there's the, uh, the biggest mismatch in terms of uh, gains from, from high resolution data. And similarly, it's not quite the same effect, but on this left-hand side, we might even try and find the whole unresolved tendency. So you take high resolution and low resolution and try and nudge the high resolution to, or the low resolution towards the high resolution model. And this is uh, sort of trying to learn the, the, the missing piece of what's missing from my low resolution dynamics to get it to my high resolution dynamics. So those are the sort of create entire new parameterization schemes. Then in the, the middle, you might have learning a parameterization scheme that is uh, currently too expensive to run in your weather or climate model, uh, but you know is a better approximation or you hope is a better approximation of the physics. Um, and uh, this is quite nice because in an offline, uh, in a setting where you're not pressed for time, so where you're not having to deliver a weather forecast in two hours time, you'll be able to run this coupled. So you can run the more expensive scheme coupled to the rest of your model. Um, so you have uh, problems of, of stability, which I might touch on again later, uh, aren't as, 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 as problematic. So I think this is really exciting in an area where we know that there exists a better scheme, but, but that might just not be known. But some examples of this are, um, in radiation, uh, where there's been some nice work to learn the sort of three-dimensional effects of interactions with, with clouds, and in uh, microphysics, where uh, people have tried to learn uh, overly expensive sort of bin, bin schemes. Um, so I can, I can talk more about that, or I can direct you in, in the direction of the paper. And then on the far right-hand side, we have learning existing schemes. And so here, the aim is really to um, accelerate a piece of the code so that you can reinvest it elsewhere. So you might, it might allow you to run at a higher resolution uh, or, or just get your answer in, in less time. And um, I think this is the easiest in terms of model stability, but it probably promises the, the, the lowest possible gains because you're not going to explicitly make your model better on its own, uh, but you're going to allow yourself to, to, to improve the model elsewhere. And there are examples in radiation um, um, and, and, and lots of others. I'm sure I've forgotten lots of excellent work here. So please don't take this as an exhaustive thing. Um, and then just to touch, I think there's a, a, another area that's also very interesting, also very active, and that's about the problem that you have lots of parameterization schemes that's really a co-tuning process. And there's some nice work out of um, Caltech with uh, Tapio Schneider's group that's trying to use uh, Bayesian methods to find the optimal tuning of these parameterization schemes together. And I think uh, this is also very interesting, but it's sort of slightly different uh, to, 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 to the main work I'll be talking about today. And so uh, what my work does, where, where we fit into the, into the, to the spectrum, is uh, so somewhere between these two. So we're, we're learning um, a variation on the existing scheme that is uh, more expensive. And so we're definitely, I think this is an easier problem uh, to, to, to solve probably than this. Um, it's a sort of maybe slightly lower hanging fruit. And one of the things that I think we're bringing to the table is getting closer to uh, an operationally forecasting setup. So higher resolutions, uh, both in vertical and horizontal to, to lots of these very interesting works that have gone before, which have been relatively coarse or have had other simplifications. 
And so this was touched on in the introduction, um, uh, but uh, there's uh, two key words that I might drop in that I want to just sort of clarify what, what I mean in this context, which is the ideas of offline and online. So um, we can, we're in a data rich scenario because we can often run our model and generate lots of data, particularly if we're doing this sort of learning of an existing scheme or learning of an overly expensive scheme, we can just run our forecasting models or our climate models for longer to generate more data. Um, uh, but we still probably want to, um, to train offline. So we want to generate a data set and then go away and learn a representation with a neural network or with some other representation. But then we can't get the full picture of how well that works until we couple that back in. And that's, uh, that can bring uh, a whole host of complications. So there's some technical complications of how we couple the typically Fortran weather and climate models with the sort of typically Python um, uh, uh, tools for machine learning. Um, but it also can highlight some problems with your models. There might be stability issues where your the, 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 the symbiosis of your model um, and your neural network uh, destabilize one another and take yourself to a, a, a set where you've never seen training data. And so um, I think it's an important point if you ever see papers on this subject or, or hear other talks, it's, it's we only really know we've, we've, we've finished it when we've completed this cycle and tested performance when we've got this uh, model coupled back in, which is a, a complicated step. It's a lot of time to invest, but it, it's necessary to learn. Okay, so what tools uh, might we be uh, using in, in these scenarios? Um, I'm gonna broadly say we're in a, we're in a supervised uh, learning setup. And typically people, um, unless I've, I've missed some work, are using either neural networks or random forests to do this work. And uh, there are various advantages and disadvantages, uh, but I would say uh, that with neural networks, we're able to, um, learn on very large data sets more efficiently and the sort of speed of inference in terms of the number of computations per, per second this works very well with the the hardware that we currently have access to um, random forests have uh, uh, can be good at being stable because uh, you, you sort of can't really force them outside their training data sets. They just sort of find you nearest neighbors effectively of, 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 of data um, but uh, but they're sort of very uh, memory intensive and this might be a problem particularly if we're on this right hand side if we're trying to learn uh, some uh, more efficient representation so my, my current view on the scenario is if you're you're learning um, to replicate a new to build a new scheme which is something on the left i think the random forests have often been shown to be the most stable when doing this final step of coupling and if you're learning an existing scheme if you're looking for acceleration i think neural networks are, 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 have often been shown to be the best um, but, but, but typically both are, are, are tested um, when, when trying to do any of these problems. So uh, what about, so I'm gonna be talking about neural networks for the rest of this talk. Um, uh, what about the design? And maybe you've heard this sort of uh, term of uh, physics informed neural networks, which is um, becoming increasingly popular. Uh, well, as I've said, our, our input data is going to typically consist of, of columns of variables, so uh, atmospheric columns of, of temperatures, of velocities, um, etc., and maybe some scalar quantities uh, describing perhaps the uh, orography of the system or, or the surface pressure or, 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 or some features like that. Um, so despite this quite structured data, the most popular choice um, typically has been the simplest one to do some sort of fully, fully connected neural network or, or also known as a sort of multi-layer perceptron. But this makes no assumption or knowledge or, or leveraging of the data layout. Uh, every, every, every point is connected to every other point. And so uh, they're very good at being sort of the most black of black boxes, but um, they perhaps aren't the most efficient. Um, and this I will hope to, to come back to. And so one of the things that's driving me at the moment is are there good network designs generically for parameterization? Given that we have this shared structure of the, the columnar element, um, is there something that is going to work well, say convolutions, um, that is going to give good performance? And then on the topic of uh, physics informed neural networks, uh, this can mean slightly different things to different people. Um, but for me, uh, people have used this term, particularly with uh, two different approaches. 
One, it's where they have tried to emulate a uh, parameterization scheme. Oh, well, typically is where they've tried to emulate parameterization schemes that might have conserved quantities in them. So it could be uh, energy, uh, energy conservation or some other quantity that you would like your, your system be to be conserved. And uh, this has been done either by using uh, custom loss functions or um, some sort of custom final activation layer to uh, reduce the number of degrees of freedom by the number of constraints that you have, and then use those constraints to, to fill in the gaps. And I think this is uh, a very interesting area. It's, it's, it's quite um, active um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, we tried this. Um, I think it is the right approach, but we t we've not been using that for in, in most of the work I'll show. show. So a um, very long introduction uh, done. So what am I going to talk about uh, here? I'm going to be talking about the uh, non-orographic gravity wave drag scheme uh, within the ECMWF IFS model. And um, we chose this for uh, a range of, of, of reasons. Um, uh, there was an element of the fact that it, it, was, a, it was a region that hadn't been, been searched before, something that hadn't been um, uh, tested to see if a good neural network could be uh, could be uh, built. Uh, but for me, the main driving effect was uh, this this scheme um, is is quite hard to spot on on shorter to medium time scales. But you really get to see it if you do um, seasonal predictions. So there you have the the quasi biennial oscillation, and um, if you if you don't have a good representation of uh, unresolved uh, non orographic gravity wave drag you typically quite, get quite a bad representation of the, of the QBO. And so uh, this was interesting because when we learn a parameterization scheme, we just learn it to, to take a single instance of time profile and produce a single instance of time tendency. And so if you want a feature that's on sort of the, the weeks to months time scale, you need your network to be accurate and consistent over all that time scale so they can the effect can be aggregated enough to see such a, a sort of slow timescale dynamic. And so uh, this was interesting because, um, as uh, Tobias had, 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 had highlighted, there have been works that where they'd shown good in either offline training or in um, short time simulations, but work had struggled for, for longer simulations. And so I thought this was a nice test bed. But uh, this, at least in the ECMWF model, is not an expensive parameterization scheme. Um, it, it is on the, the, the cheaper end. Uh, I think it's somewhere on the order of 1% of the total runtime of the model. That depends a bit on, 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 on the setup. And so by solving this, we're, we're not going to dramatically uh, speed up the model. Um, but we might learn some lessons along the way. So I, 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 treat, I went after this as sort of what can we learn that we can hopefully apply to more and more of the, the complex schemes and try and build up a whole uh, zoo of, 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 of parameterization emulators. So I probably will um, not go into too much detail itself on the non-orographic gravity wave drag scheme. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. Um, uh, there's some citations for, um, for, for the origins of this work, uh, which uh, the, the, the model was sort of started in, in 1996 and then adapted um, and built into the IFS in, in 2010. Um, and what it's trying to capture is um, uh, gravity waves that might originate from, um, uh, for example, convection that are happening um, uh, sub the sort of 10 kilometer or 30 kilometer scale, but are going to propagate upwards and typically deposit momentum. So change the, the, the flow uh, higher up in the atmosphere. Um, and this does have an impact on, on shorter time scales, but particularly we see it uh, for things like the QBO. So what I have down here are some um, time pressure plots um, of a series of one year forecasts using on the left the existing uh, non orographic gravity wave drag scheme and on the right uh, the scheme that it replaced which is a very simple sort of um, a friction model and the key feature that I want to, to bring your attention to is this de descent and, and weakening of, 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 of the jets that you see. So this is a, a zonal jet so looking at the U flow averaged um, uh, um, um, across uh, uh, in the longitudinal direction um, near the equator, so um, uh, minus five to five degrees, 
And uh, what you see is this semi-regular pattern. And these vertical lines are because I start a new simulation. Um, uh, this semi-regular pattern, nowhere near as regular as here, but key uh, this descent phase where you start to get down sort of uh, 10 to the four pascals, um, and you can start to particularly have an impact on, 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 on other features. And so this is the phenomena that's uh, high up in our list of things we would like to get right once we come back into to building something. And I'm going to um, uh, skip over um, uh, this uh, slide um, and instead uh, talk uh, about uh, a little bit about the details. So um, we, we, we have a source of momentum fairly low in the atmosphere. Uh, that is uh, propagating upwards. And at each of the model levels, what's happening in the scheme is uh, some stability characteristics being uh, calculated. And then depending on, on the stability, uh, we might get momentum being deposited at each of the, the, the layers. And uh, this, uh, this momentum is being launched up at a range of angles in the horizontal direction and with a range of different wave speeds. So this is sort of a... Uh, a, a, a uh, a, a set of different wave speeds um, to, to approximate a continuum of wave speeds. And what we did um, was I wanted to explore whether how, how, how learning a model changed when you increase the complexity. And so what I did is I took the existing scheme and turned up this internal discretization. So the, the, the operational version of the model launched momentum in four different angles and used 20 different elements to uh, describe this wave speed space. And I uh, made a somewhat arbitrary cost uh, increase in the, the, the cost of this to increase the number of angles and increase the wave speed. So this is a, a better internal representation of the system, partly because I was interested to see whether that made the system harder to, for a machine learning uh, system to, 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 to learn. And what this does is this increases the, um, uh, the number of floating point operations by um, a, a factor 20, because uh, linear in these features, um, and the actual online cost of this scheme uh, went up by about a factor of 10. So it would have turned into uh, a fairly significant portion of the IFS cost, uh, still not the most expensive element if, if this were to go operational. Um, and this makes a difference. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing here is still no uh, neural networks, but just the comparison between um, the, the operational version of this scheme and this higher complexity, which I, if, if uh, sort of the patterning for the rest of this talk, you'll see this HC uh, moniker that I uh, um, added uh, version of the scheme where I've tuned up the internal representation and it improves the forecasts. So this is looking at the uh, the errors of the IFS forecast um, against uh, against the analyzed state of the atmosphere. And this is showing now in a different projection, because I like to keep you on your toes, of, of latitude and pressure. And blue is showing that you've improved the forecast versus the existing scheme. And uh, the hashings are indicating where that's significantly uh, improved. And this is over um, uh, about a set of uh, 60 forecasts covering both uh, northern and southern hemisphere winters. And he, the key point is that both in the winds and the temperature, which is these left and right uh, things, we see improvements, particularly over the poles um, and um, particularly sort of above uh, 10 uh, hectopascals. So um, improving this internal discretization does increase the overall model performance. And these patterns I will um, come back to later on in the talk. So um, yeah, what did, uh, how do we do this? What's the cycle of building a parameterization scheme, uh, an emulator of a parameterization scheme? Well, we uh, generate data by running the existing scheme, or in fact, the higher complexity scheme coupled to the IFS. And then we uh, save that data. Um, so uh, here, uh, what we were using is a 25 kilometer model with 91 model levels, uh, which has a top at about one Pascal. And uh, then we want to uh, train a neural network to, 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 to predict these tendencies. And what I did here for the moment is uh, build a fully connected neural network, but we want to search over the hyperparameter space um, uh, to see how the complexity, how the number of internal degrees of freedom in the system change what, how good a representation it is. And uh, what do we get when we do that? Well, this is a representation of the number of degrees of freedom, which is uh, proportional to the number of floating point operations in the system against the offline error of the system. 
So, uh, what, and this is a uh, log log scale. Uh, so we see uh, something approximately uh, power law behavior. And you see, as I increase my internal representation, I get lower and lower errors. And I'm able to come up with uh, something suggesting the cost of the existing scheme and something um, uh, uh, figuring out the approximate uh, error of the existing scheme. This can be measured in a couple of different ways, um, uh, but that doesn't change this line very much. And the what I've called purely coincidental effect is that uh, at the point where uh, you go below this dotted line is about the point where you cross this uh, vertical dotted line. So these all meet in the middle at about something of uh, 10 to the five degrees of freedom in the system. Um, so uh, that's interesting, but in fact, not that useful. I mean, it tells you, you can use this to learn what the optimal neural network is for a given number of degrees of freedom, because within this I've searched over the parameter space, but it doesn't tell you if these mean squared error answers are actually good enough, because these are just the representation of how well you've learned the non orographic gravity wave drag scheme, not what will be the impact on uh, a forecast of something that we might care about. So the next step is we, is, is uh, so yes, so offline error is a tunable parameter. Uh, the next step is we need to couple the neural network uh, solution to the IFS. And this is still uh, something that I'd say is, is a slightly clunky step. Um, I wrote a simple um, uh, module uh, leveraging GLASS to, to, to write something in Fortran to do this. This has now been made uh, more serious by, um, or, or a, a parallel group of work by, by Ott has made this uh, Fortran Keras bridge, which allows you to try and bring uh, neural networks into Fortran, at least for inference. So this is one way, but I think that the future will have even better ways of coupling in this model. And this is a sort of, uh, 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 we're in a developmental phase, let's say. So, so this step takes a moderate amount of time to make sure you've done it right. And then the answer is to uh, run coupled simulations. And the thing you're trying to test is the accuracy and the stability. And there, the element is whereabouts on this uh, descending line do we actually need to be? If we're up here, just because the error is high, does it actually make a difference to model performance? Um, equivalently, uh, if I'm down here, yes, I have a, a lower error than the existing scheme, but it might be that it has a horrible bias that destabilizes the model. Uh, so here is, uh, again, uh, this similar plot of time and pressure here. I've now done a longer run, so you don't have these nasty vertical lines where I restart the simulation. And this is, again, the zonal jet between uh, minus five and five, showing this uh, descent and semi-regular behavior of QBO. And this is the existing um, non orographic gravity wave drag scheme coupled to the um, IFS model. And here is my uh, neural network emulator. And they are different, as we might fully expect, uh, of a uh, two simulations that have been run for several years. They are not identical. Uh, you could argue that there is a uh, some some noise right at the top of the atmosphere that you don't see uh, in the existing scheme. Um, but with the exception of that, uh, you would see very similar patterns in terms of both the uh, physics scheme and the neural network emulator. So we have something that we can run for um, uh, multi years while still getting a stable answer. And we, we reproduce this um, quasi biennial um, um, behavior of, of the zonal jet. So that is uh, a big success. So uh, how does this uh, match to this sort of where should we be on this, this plot? Um, so uh, I didn't actually tell you, but we were, we were somewhere in the middle actually um, for, 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 for this neural network emulator, um, but that's what I wanted uh, to test. So uh, here is a sort of different view of the same data. So uh, now we're looking at the same forecast. So now we're looking at latitude and pressure plots. And here you have two different versions of the existing scheme. So here is the one, the data that I actually trained on. Here is the one that's operational. And then here are four different neural networks that have been trained with slightly different losses. And uh, these ones down here are 10 times more expensive than these ones down here. So this is increasing cost. And then just to show you um, what would happen, I have the, the old version of, of, of the, uh, the scheme down here which uses uh, Rayleigh friction. Uh, so these are the zonal jets for, for June, July, August. And on the right are the differences. So taking this as uh, the truth and looking at the difference between all of these. And you see, uh, you see what? Well, you see actually in this plot, there's very little difference between the two existing uh, versions of the scheme. Um, it's quite hard to spot uh, in, in their average characteristics. 
and you see that there are slightly larger errors uh, when we use um, 100,000 degrees of freedom uh, instead if we use uh, a million degrees of freedom. And definitely when we get down to uh, a million degrees of freedom, then uh, we, we have a smaller errors than the difference between these two versions of the existing scheme. Um, and so uh, the answer is increasing complexity helps, but, but not very much. These are still quite, quite small errors. And if I made other tweaks to the model, I would expect to see similar differences in, in, uh, subtly in, in the zonal jet. So uh, that was looking at the sort of long time characteristics of what happens if I, I run the model. What about more from a weather forecasting perspective? So um, I showed uh, this plot before. Um, this is looking at the, uh, the uh, oh, what have I got here? Sorry, yes. Uh, yes, so on the left is a plot you've seen before. So this is showing what happens when I, um, when I, when I use my high complexity version of the scheme versus my low complexity version of the scheme. And the point was to show that actually in forecasting mode, it makes a difference. So we get more accurate, um, uh, particularly temperature forecasts uh, over the poles. And on the right, uh, I have the same plot, but here I've used a, a neural network rather than my uh, more expensive version. And the key feature to take away is that the patterns on the left and the right are almost identical. So the gains that we saw when using the increased complexity version of the scheme have been matched by the neural network. So we've not only learnt a representation of, of, of non-orographic gravity wave drag, but we've captured this subtle improvement that we see from learning the high complexity version of the scheme. So this sort of shows um, exactly how well we've, we've learned it to sort of quite a high degree of fidelity. Um, this, this is sort of reproduced in the winds as well. There's currently a small degradation uh, right up high in um, around the equator for the neural network. Uh, this is something that I now think I understand and, and it's just a, um, a, 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 mis a small mistake I made in the setup. I think this now can be corrected. So I'm rerunning some simulations to hopefully even remove this degradation. And in the weather forecasting uh, setup, what we actually see is very little benefit from the most expensive networks. So while for the, uh, the, the more climate or longer runs, we saw some improvement um, of, of going from sort of 100,000 degrees of freedom to a million degrees of freedom. Uh, when we do that in a more weather forecasting, so I've done a very bad job of explaining these plots. These are, these are the errors after 48, 120, um, uh, 180 and 240 hours so after five and ten days and, and thereabouts in between um, so on, on these time scales this is actually a plot with a hundred thousand degrees of freedom if i run it with a million degrees of freedom you would see almost an identical feature so uh, this is suggesting that there is still some small improvements that you can see over very long times from the most expensive um, uh, networks so um, I've, I've thrown around the word of degrees of freedom quite a lot um, and i've not actually asked answered the question but is it faster uh, and this is a uh, this is an easy question to ask, and I would argue it's quite a hard question to answer, uh, because what is a fair comparison? Um, so uh, if we compare it on a uh, CPU to the uh, version that I designed that was more uh, more computationally expensive, so that where I inter it tuned up the number of degrees of freedom, then we're about ten times faster. Uh, but all this does is actually bring us down to the same cost of the existing scheme. So we have learned a better representation uh, for the same price. So we could sort of slot it in as a replacement. However, this is perhaps not the, the fairest comparison because neural networks really weren't designed or don't run optimally on a, on a, on a CPU. You want to run those on a GPU. Um, that's a bit complicated um, to do at ECMWF because we don't yet have the hardware. We're, uh, soon getting a, a new supercomputer that will have GPUs and so we can do these tests. And so the question will be, if you start offloading this work to a GPU for the gravity wave drag calculations, whether we can bring that down even further. Um, although I'm expecting the gains to be quite short because you have the cost of transferring the data over and transferring the data back. And because this isn't so expensive, we're probably going to see very marginal gains or maybe even a slowdown if we just solve one parameterization scheme on it. And so sort of my, uh, the, the, the long-term goal might be to try and emulate lots of parameterization schemes so that you can send the data off to use neural networks for many of them back to back on a GPU and use the hardware even more efficiently. So, um, Tobias, um, how long would you like me to speak for? <laughs>
would like to go on. Um, <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to say. Okay, I will um, speak. There were a couple of other interesting topics. I will try and um, keep them uh, short, um, uh, but we're we're approaching the end, so so fear not. Uh, so one yeah, of we those definitely was don't the, have a heart limit. I, okay, so one just... of those was the idea of uh, neural network design. So I took a very lazy approach uh, in terms of using a multi-layer perceptron or a fully connected neural network with some number of um, hidden layers and some, some, some width that I've sort of hidden the details behind the scenes. Uh, but this is uh, not very pleasing design, I'd say, because it's sort of this idea that um, every, every point is connected to every other point doesn't feel like something that would be happening physically in the system. And so I spent quite a while trying to explore um, different setups of the network to try and see, or different architectural designs to see if some of them would work better than others um, and see if there'd be more efficient representations and maybe more pleasing representations, even though that's a, a hard thing to pin down. And, and a very natural thing to think about are convolutions. So the, the, these might be appealing because they're, they're local stencils um, in terms of operations and lots of the, 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 the actions that we're, we're looking at uh, in these parameterizations are local connections. You might be looking at local gradients of winds um, or, or, or similar features that could be encoded um, in, in a convolutional structure. But here, the complexity that we have generically in weather and climate models is that our vertical grid is sort of laid out in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a complex way, right? So we have um, a grid that is not laid out equally, neither in pressure space or in, 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 in actual height above the surface. And so um, if you try and use a convolution that has the same, um, uh, the same weights down at the bottom of the atmosphere and up at the top of the atmosphere, that's going to be representing different spatial gradients or different pressure gradients. And so uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect this to, 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 to give you a good answer because there's a different balance of physics and there's a, there's a different spatial scale going on here. Um, and when I tried this in the system, when I tried to use a very convolutional based approach and try and get rid of all these fully connected neural networks, uh, all these fully connected layers, I find that my model performance um, uh, is, is dramatically worse. So I can't, I can't, I can't get down to the same uh, uh, levels that I found before. And I actually think that the, the problem there was not just one of convolutions being um, inappropriate, but also because while some of the operations are local, some of the operations can be can be global. Um, so there could be some 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 integral condition that's that's needed for stability. And that is going to be very slow to calculate in a in a convolution because it's going to depend on the number of layers and the width of the convolution you use. And so to, to integrate up the full domain is, is, is going to require a lot of depth and therefore be harder to train. So uh, I sort of decided to go and try and uh, toy around with this and sort of invent some blocks. Um, and my, my, my answer to this, um, uh, and I'd be really interested to hear other people's uh, thoughts on this, was to create a, a hybrid of something that was partially uh, dense or partially fully connected and partially uh, local. So uh, in this, uh, this is what I've tried to sketch out in, in this hybrid block. So what does, what does an input look at an arbitrary level or particularly at the input of your model? We have a set of variables and you have to set of vertical levels. And maybe, maybe you have some auxiliary inputs that are, uh, um, uh, don't have any vertical dependence. And so what I, what I did was I wanted to have a network that could do both. So I feed this into some dense, a small number of dense calculations because dense calculations are, are, are large, can be large matrices and so can become very expensive. So I want this to be a small number of things to allow for a small number of, of vertical integrals or vertical calculations where you've got access to the whole grid. And then I want to stack those back up in addition to the inputs and then use uh, something called a locally connected layer, which is like a convolution, uh, but the weights aren't shared between locally uh, between different layers. So the, late, the, the weights can be learned for each level. And so uh, from the idea of uh, linear algebra, this is a banded matrix. This is a sparse uh, banded matrix instead of um, a, a, a dense matrix uh, for a fully connected neural network. And so I built this, uh, I built this design, I, I put a few of these objects back to back to allow for some depth. And this worked quite well, actually, this uh, improved the efficiency in terms of the number of degrees of freedom by about a factor of three. 
um, uh, because of some technical difficulties, I've not been able to do uh, online testing yet in terms of coupled back to the IFS to see whether this is, is, is reproduced. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I think it might not be as much as a factor of three. Uh, but I think this is a, an interesting area because uh, uh, my, my view is that a good design for one uh, parameterization scheme will have a lot of similarities with another parameterization scheme because uh, there are some generic problems within this representation. Uh, the next element that often comes up in these talks is the idea of uh, trusting the neural network parameterization scheme. How do we um, establish trust enough for it to be used in an operational or weather or climate forecasting scenario? And I think that's a good question. I'm not sure whether we have really good answers for it, um, but here's a few things of, of, of what people uh, are doing at the moment. Um, uh, one is to try and test accuracy in terms of as other model components change, check that you're not too tuned to an exact setup. So that may be in the uh, setting of uh, operational forecasting to move to the next cycle. The, the, these operational models are constantly evolving as people change different components of the model and checking that you're not only getting results for one cycle of the model, but if someone else changes the convection scheme, uh, you continue to get accurate answers. Uh, a second thing might be to try and change the model climatology. Um, maybe change it by doing something as, as sort of um, like changing the, the amount of CO2 in the system uh, or some uh, more subtle shift and checking that you're still getting the right answer. Uh, or the other option might be to try and uh, either learn or test on synthetic data. So this might be where you, you get the inputs that you already have to your parameterization scheme, you perturb them in some perhaps uh, random way, and then you run them through the existing scheme so that your input data isn't, isn't, isn't necessarily as physical, uh, but that you've still explored sort of beyond the, uh, the space of existing uh, uh, inputs. Uh, we did um, a few of those, um, but I think the, the harshest test we did was to uh, turn off the sponge layer in the model. So um, typically at the top of these uh, models, you have uh, some quite severe damping to ensure stability at the top of the model. And what we did was we, 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 we turned that off and ran our neural network forward coupled to the IFS uh, in a scenario that it never seen before. The wind speeds are much higher. And the thing that I was actually surprised by is the model was still stable. So that was the good news is, uh, the other interesting feature was it actually started doing some of the damping itself. So it wanted to try and uh, restore back to the climate, a, a little bit towards the climatology that it had seen. Um, and so this is what's being shown here is, uh, this is what happens uh, for, again, this uh, time pressure plot without the sponge with the existing uh, gravity wave drag scheme. And here is with one of my neural networks. And you'll notice that the wind speeds are slower. The wind speeds are still much faster than you would see uh, with the sponge on, uh, but the model uh, my neural network is trying to, 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 to damp that. So uh, whether that's a good thing, I think uh, depends on your, um, uh, your, your point of view. But I thought it was interesting, actually, the model was stable. Um, and these kinds of tests uh, uh, more broadly are really important if we want to try and take these parameterization schemes or these emulated parameterization schemes into an operational setting. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to spend three more minutes and then we'll stop. And that is talking about a sister paper that we have um, uh, for the very important task of data assimilation. Uh, so data assimilation is the idea of um, getting the initial condition to your forecasting model. Um, this is a, a, a very complicated and very expensive part of the procedure. So at ECMWF, it takes about uh, one hour to generate the initial condition and then one hour to do the forecast. So it, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a small step in, in this forecasting system. It's, 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 it's a very important part. And depending on the way you formulate this problem, because it, ideally you're, you're trying to do a minimization problem, you're trying to find the initial condition that best matches your recent observations. And one of the approaches for this is the so-called uh, 4D variational approach. So this is where you're uh, propagating gradients forwards and backwards in time in order to nudge your old forecast to one that better matches your correct forecast. And uh, this method performs very well, but what it requires is you to be able to pass derivatives forwards and backwards through your model. So it requires for every component that you have in your uh, in your model, you to have a 
a tangent linear and an adjoint version of your, uh, of your scheme. So for non-orographic gravity wave drag, I have to be able to provide um, a, a, an X naught and then a delta X, and it will tell me what the impact is. If I put in this gradient, uh, what is the output? And this requires uh, typically maintaining by hand and often the simplification of these schemes because hand arriving these tangent linear and adjoint models is uh, expensive. But if we have a neural network, uh, this actually becomes quite simple. So the complexity in a neural network, unless you go and invent the most complicated set of interacting um, models, but particularly if you, if you do a fully connected neural network, the complexity is all in the weights. And so taking the gradients to give you the either the tangent linear or the adjoint is very easy and almost as cheap. And so what we did in this uh, sister paper is to test whether these were accurate enough uh, derivatives uh, to be used in the data assimilation process. And the plots I have are a little too expensive to, to talk about in, in just a minute. You can ask me questions if you want, but the short answer is we were able to, we'd done such a good job emulating the non-linear version of the gravity wave drag scheme that our tangent linear and adjoint could be used in data assimilation. And they didn't give us any degradation of the, of the following forecasts. So we were able to do away with hand deriving these um, the, 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 these uh, these TL and AD versions of the code and still produce an accurate forecast. So uh, what are the next steps? Well, we always want to be testing these models more to make sure we've not missed anything. So if you have any suggestions, I'm very interested. But the main thing I'm working on at the moment is trying to take these lessons and apply them to more complicated schemes. So we're currently trying to see whether we can uh, do this for the radiation scheme, which is by far the, which is one of the most expensive um, uh, uh, physics schemes in the IFS model. And uh, this is part of the, the Maelstrom uh, Euro HBC project that I'm um, uh, part of. Uh, but uh, the 4D VAR component, I think, is a very exciting one, particularly for the, the weather forecasting problem. So with that, I will stop. And any questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much for your talk, Matthew. Um, and not only for, for what you presented of your work, but also for this great overview of the different parameterization ML methods and how they kind of interact or where you fit in there. I think that was great. Um, and yeah, I would like to give this on to the audience if there are any questions. David. Um, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, thanks. First of all, really interesting talk, uh, really nice work. I mean, uh, on a high level, I'd like to ask you, uh, why do you think you saw so much success with the coupled version of your model when so many other papers using neural networks ran into all kinds of issues with long-term accuracy and stability? I muted myself, which is always dangerous in these events, isn't it? That's that's a great question, and uh, would take me back to um, uh, if I could do it uh, right at the beginning. Uh, I think the main place uh, we want to talk about is where people fit on the spectrum of these approaches, and I think in quite a lot of cases, the work where people have struggled the most with um, with stability uh, is 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 towards the left hand side of these approaches. So uh, either learning from high resolution data uh, or from um, uh, so called sort of super parameterization schemes, and and that's why they've seen the stability and 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 that's uh it, it's it's just a challenging uh task because you're you're trying to build a new model component that you you might not be stable anyway if someone invents a new parameterization scheme that isn't a neural network that might stable destabilize the model so i think that's a a big element uh of it i think in places where people have tried to do things more on the right hand side uh i don't think there have been as many times where stability has been a problem those that have I would then invoke the volume of data that they've exposed their models to. So something that we weren't really heavy in is to leverage the fact that we can, we're in a sort of the, the almost the, the limit of infinite data, right? I, running my model just once for a few years to generate data is not very expensive. It's the fact that I have to do it twice a day, every day. And so I ran the model for, 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 for quite a few years and saved it at high spatial and temporal fidelity. And so I had, uh, I think, 30 million 
um, uh, examples of, of, of the columnar problem to do. And when I tried dropping this, even by a factor of, I can't remember what the factor was. I think I dropped it to 30 million, which would still be quite a large example by a lot of these uh, historical pieces of work. Um, uh, I saw a, a noticeable degradation in my offline results. I never tested those online. And so I don't know if those models that were trained on a smaller data set would have been un, uh, like less stable. But I, I think that's another element that people have not lent on enough is, is uh, I mean, particularly on the right hand side, they can they can always generate more data and make sure that they've covered uh, uh, different times of year, different times of day, um, different parts of the globe and, and sampled that space well. And that's a really interesting answer. I have to admit, it's not what I expected. Um, and I think you make a strong point about having enough data and maybe some of the cases that ran into these issues didn't have enough data. I mean, on the one hand, the other study that really did manage to do these long-term predictions, if admittedly in a very simple setup, was the um, RASP and Gentine PNAS study that you have on the left side of the curve. And then on the right-hand side, at least there are some studies I know of looking at warm rain and, um, and looking at uh, chem atmospheric chemistry and these kind of things where they actually got very good offline error, even on held out test data. But when they couple the, uh, when they do coupled uh, runs or when they self iterate the output back into the input for many time steps, they find the thing sort of diverges. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe one solves this with more data. I just wonder if perhaps um, the problem is that we're not training the network for the task we actually wanted to solve. Uh, I mean, are you sort of hinting at the, the concept of sort of uh, online or sort of somewhat online training? Maybe something in that direction or, or, or something that would... I mean, I think, I think, yeah. I think if, if you could solve, if you can solve the, um, the, 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 the complexities of that, uh, then I think that 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 is, of course, there's that, that's a great way to go about because that is obviously what we care about is is doing that. And there are some some people, I believe, Chris Bretherton's group are are trying to go about that, perhaps building the model so that they can differentiate through the whole thing and thereby um, uh, and thereby learn for multiple time steps in a row. Um, I, I I think if you can make it work, that's that's great. Um, I think it's a very complicated thing to solve. Hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. Eduardo, I think you have a question. Um, yeah, I have a short question <clears throat> on the suggestions that you, you made um, when you talked about the GPUs. Uh, so you suggested that perhaps the um, neural networks could be offloaded to the GPUs. Uh, because they are well um, better designed for the, those type of operations, and I'm I'm wondering if what would happen in a situation in which we just don't deal with one parameterization but with several several parameterizations that have been replaced by a neural network differently. Um, for instance, in your case, you may have uh, replaced the the WFD track parameterization with one neural network, and at the same time, you would like to replace, let's say, the, the uh, convective precipitation in the tropics by another neural network. My question would be, is the expected error just additive? Or, or put it in another way, can we pack so many neural networks to replace so many parameterizations at the point that the model just breaks down? Uh, I, I, I think that's a good question. I don't think I can have an answer because I think an element will be that we we, we need to, to try it and no one's got that far in terms of trying to put many of these together. I, I guess it depends how they've been constructed and whether we can expect their their, their errors to be independent or, or uh, and, and, and on average unbiased. Um, so that might go back to, to network design. I think uh, that seems to me the, the best possible hope of, of gaining real large jumps in computational efficiency but you're 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 right that 
Um, not only would you need to test each of the parameter parameterization emulators on their own, but you'd also need to test them together and check that, mm. that, that, that they are stable together and they don't nudge one another to a new climate that's not been seen. So um, I, I'm also just, uh, you, the, the the moving data backwards and forwards is is also a non-trivial aspect of the, of the cost that people uh, sometimes like to brush under the carpet in terms of saying GPUs will solve this and you have to be able to give enough work to the GPU to to, to make this a worthwhile trade mm -hmm. to, to send data backwards and forwards. Okay, thank you. Do you know if anyone ever tried to run um, in a numerical weather prediction model with multiple Machine learning learned um, parameterizations. Uh, I I wouldn't like to. I'm not. I I don't know the answer to that. My I, okay. okay. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Or if they have, I think it's been areas where uh, there are several parameterization schemes that cover quite similar pieces of physics that could also be maybe classified as a single one. I, I don't I don't know, for example, where someone has taken a convection emulator and a radiation emulator, like two, two very big hitting um, effects on your, your, your climate model and done those together and seen whether that works. Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, it would be interesting to, uh, to, to, to try that. I mean, if I can chime in on that point, it's just, I think, quite an interesting question. I mean, in many cases, it depends on the model. What you have is these different parameterization routines that are actually, you know, computing tendencies, which might be added together. Uh, and of course, sequence matters and, and all these fine technical details. But in the end, it may be that you can gain some benefit by, by printing them at once because you're just going to combine the results anyway. Yes, I, I I I agree, and I think that's sort of um, that's something to to do. It's 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 on my list of things I'd like to do if I find the time would be to generate a a full a full set of outputs for the entirety of say the ECMWF model that says can you learn all of them together? Um, uh, not necessarily expecting it to work, but to seeing how close one could get. I would also like to talk a bit about your hybrid approach, which I found super interesting. Um, so your idea behind this was you wanted to have something that's actually cheaper than these fully connected layers because you said um, information doesn't need to be shared across all heights, right? Like um, they're there for these locally connected layers. Um, but what I don't completely understand here is, is your dance. Um, Annotation. So do you mean by dance here, a fully connected layer? Yes, I mean a fully connected layer, a, 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 a not very wide fully connected layer. That was the concept. It was that there are there are places where you could have a, a, a global stability calculation possibly being required or something, something where you needed the integral of the full model column in order to make the next step. And so it was giving an idea for this sort of ability to mostly do local calculations, but with some 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 column integrated variables being being able to be calculated i uh, i it was mostly born out of a frustration that i couldn't find i, I thought a very local approach would have worked um and and couldn't make that work and so this was a, an attempt to, to 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 argue why that yeah to, to solve that problem yeah i think in the paper itself you kind of argue a bit more on why you tried this uh, i find this very interesting uh, Eduardo has another question, I see. Um, well, mostly a comment to David, uh, but related to, to your last comment and the answer. Um, perhaps, David, do you remember that, that we had a very short discussion in the last workshop about the balance between locality and couple systems, and that that could have a contradiction in itself. It would be two goals that are not compatible. And I think that here, uh, in this very nice hybrid block, perhaps we may be seeing an aspect of that. So an attempt to, let's say, to keep the, the whole system coupled, in this case, so the, the whole air column, and uh, also trying to, to gain some benefits of, of a local approach, but uh, which is difficult. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree. 
I definitely think we need new um, we need new building blocks to deal with these kind of problems than than other than what machine learning has dealt with traditionally. So I think this is quite interesting. If I understand right, Matthew, these locally connected layers, you basically have the same connectivity you would have in a convolution, but every, every weight is specific to a, a pair of locations and is learned yes. directly, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that it's it's typically it is available in sort of I mean this was I was doing this in TensorFlow so it's 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 in TensorFlow it's probably in PyTorch as well uh, these cap of layers then they're, they're not they don't seem to be very popular and if you ever run into problems with them you don't find very many people using them because so many people are dealing with homogeneous um, systems where they want to fully leverage the the minimal weight nature of the 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 convolution um but it 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 feels like these these operators can uh th this type of layer will be quite appropriate for lots of different applications i'm also interested in working on a a problem of bias correction of of model output and there again i think um you have this idea of locality where you might want to here if you're thinking about a latitude longitude map you might want to mostly use local spatial information in terms to see the features of where you're getting the wrong answer, but you also know that the, the balance of physics or indeed, again, the spacing of the grid is not the same uh, or, um, uh, down um, sort of in the tropics as it is over, over me in, in, in Reading. So you might want uh, uh, the, the, the same shape as a convolution, but not the same weights or not all the whole place, but it does, it, it does increase your number of degrees of freedom. And so, um, uh, as a fitting problem, it can become quite a lot harder. All right. I don't see any more questions. Is there anything in the chat, David? Uh, no, nothing else. There is also nothing on YouTube. Then. Um, I believe I read your training data as publicly available. Yes, uh, yes, it's it's been uh, it's been made available. So if someone wants to have a play with it, uh, they if they look up the uh, uh, this um, Maelstrom project, uh, we've actually made some data sets uh, public. So part of this is um, to sort of plug it a little bit. This is trying to be a sort of co-design um, cycle where we are trying to build. Uh, what we think are interesting uh, data sets. Then we're trying to explore what software tools we need to do that and to do that in a fairly optimal way. And also what hardware is going to work best for that, uh, for, for a range of different problems. So we've got uh, me representing the uh, parameterization uh, emulation problem. And then we have people looking at um, post-processing or downscaling problem. And so there's a data set for that. And um, there's also um, a few other data sets. So one about sort of a wind farm application trying to bias correct uh, uh, uh model output towards uh wind farms so those are all uh, just recently being published so uh if you if you uh if you google uh sort of uh, maelstrom machine learning you'll be able to find links to those they're all quite easily downloadable um uh, uh you can uh, with python so go and uh, have a look and if you have any questions do get in contact with me yeah awesome um is the code to train the models also available uh i have not published uh yet my uh, my gravity wave drag code i've been lazy in in, in leasing it up to a place where someone else can can use it so uh there are um, example work uh, notebooks showing how you get started so each of them comes with a notebook showing how you download and load the data which can be done in a couple of lines of python and then some uh some simple benchmarks for 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 building those in terms of uh so it actually in the case of non-graphic gravity wave drag a fully connected neural network you can write down in a few layers in a few in a few uh, steps so uh, that one is is uh, the, the 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 example within the jupyter notebook gets pretty good result anyway so you could go away if you had a good idea for an alternate um uh, uh layout of, of a model you could go and compare that to a fully connected neural network and, and see if you can beat that all right and then thanks again very much for joining us today um thanks Thank everyone for else me. for joining today and Great I guess talk. I'll see you all in two weeks.
Thanks, everyone.